Join us in this insightful episode as we explore the dynamic landscape of imported brands in South Africa with Greg Kress, who is the Principal Director for Automotive and E-Mobility at Accenture South Africa. Principal Director for Automotive and E-Mobility at Accenture South Africa. Otherwise, Greg, um, how are you doing? Oh, well, no, well, just a busy week here at the Endurance uh, SA Auto Week um, and also off the back of a, of a long four-day four electric vehicle road trip which happened last week, which was also quite a, an adventure. What we're going to be talking about today, what forms the, the part of this conversation, we're discussing the shifting landscape of imported brands within South Africa and uh, the impact of evolving consumer behaviors and how these brands can stay competitive in the dynamic market. And basically, it's going to take me to my first question, which was, how do you see the African continental free trade area impacting imported goods? There's been a lot of talk around that and looking at imported brands market in South Africa and what opportunities or challenges do you foresee for local businesses? Okay, as far as the Africa free trade continental agreement is concerned, it's a really important agreement that should be maintained and uh, uh, looked after at all at all costs. It's, it's a very important um, uh, trade agreement that allows the flow of, uh, of, of vehicles and, and goods and components um, and minerals throughout the throughout the African continent and any sort of constraint on that wouldn't be I think a positive development but when we look at the landscape of the automotive OEMs that have set up shop so to speak in South Africa from a manufacturing perspective I mean it's now been a uh, hundred years I would say that NAMS is now celebrating in a centenary year and uh, this is really testament to the the longevity of the industry in South Africa and its importance on the continent. Um, so from a manufacturing perspective, if you're an OEM, uh, you know, they've gone through a long uh, transition and a long evolution with, with deep and rich history of being, uh, you know, prominent players within the South African economy and on the continent. However, I think what we see now is that South Africans in general are facing an affordability crisis um, and that really is creating um, a pressure point mm-hmm. on their, their choices that they have to make when it comes to the purchasing of uh, new vehicles. Yeah. So with that, with that being said, you know, we, we, we would expect to see other entrants could come into the market um, to take advantage of this affordability crisis and bring high value, um, premium, but affordable vehicles as options to to the consumers that need them um, mm-hmm. and, and it's no surprise then that we you know traditionally or we originally saw the entrance uh, many years ago of, of Korean companies like Kia and Hyundai and in those times it was um, you know uh, very early models that they brought in but they took the advantage and they came in but uh, now most recently you're seeing you know the rise of uh, manufacturers that are coming out of India and out of China um, and uh, these are the, the vehicles that they are offering are right in the sweet spot of affordability for South Africans. So I'm talking about the 250,000 Rand range up yeah. to the 350,000 Rand range where um, you know, a recent st- a data point from NAMSA was that 66.3% of vehicles sold in 2023 uh, were below 500,000 Rand, wow. uh, which, is, which is the majority. So with that, with that kind of uh, development, um, it's 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 really playing out now that the um, importers and the retailers of these vehicles are, are. It's no surprise to see them in the top three best-selling uh, vehicles on a monthly basis when you look at the figures. So just in summary on that, I mean, we have to find a situation now or a solution where the established OEMs who have taken the risk to build factories in South Africa can meet the domestic needs of consumers in South Africa um, at a price point that fits their budgets. Um, Otherwise, this trend will continue. Now, important brands within South Africa, how do you think, how do you see them adapting to this shift while navigating the whole local infrastructure and regulatory challenges? So this is a very interesting scenario we're seeing in in, uh, South African terms. Um, The rise of electric vehicles around the world has has taken the world by storm. Um, The the disruption that they're bringing, um, in a positive way, because they really are the if, if, if charged the correct way, are the solution to to get towards a, a sustainable emissions-free mobility. But we're seeing that the rise of this is really coming from the east, um, and it, it, this is coming from uh, companies like um, BYD and CATL, who yeah. really have been the world leaders in developing new 
energy storage solutions. And I'm, and I'm, ta- I'm, I'm using that term very deliberately because energy storage has been a, a breakthrough um, that's happened over the past 10 years that yeah. has driven the uptake and the, and, the, and the scalability of electric cars to, to, to have these batteries that, have, that are energy dense enough to provide the right level of range uh, and the fast level of charging times. Now, with that um, uh, acceleration of technology coming out of China, um, it's it's a a no coincidence that they're also able to do this at scale. And when you do something at scale, you can do something at at the lowest cost base possible. So new entrants coming into multiple markets around the world, um, notwithstanding South Africa, but if you look at the EU, you look at the US, you look at Australia, these vehicles are, are making a, a, a very significant impact into those markets as well. Um, and South Africa will follow. We've seen entrants coming in um, like the likes of uh, GWM with the Aura. You look at uh, BYD with the Atto 3 and the uh, Seal uh, and the Dolphin, which is the most affordable uh, electric vehicle um, offered as a new vehicle on South African roads at 539,000 Rand. Uh, we, we are slowly but surely going to breach the 500,000 Rand uh, price point and I also see us going below the 400,000 Rand price point not there not long thereafter Um, and when that happens you know we start to go into um, a situation where mass adoption um, is is possible uh, or or greater adoption is possible when the price point between a a 350,000 Rand petrol car is exactly the same as an equivalent electric vehicle car which has got all the technology as well as zero fuel uh, implications. So I think we're very much in for a very interesting uh, ride coming up over the next 12 to 18 months for sure. As global brands increasingly prioritize sustainability and we see the whole environmental responsibility, and how can important brands in South Africa integrate these values into their business models while maintaining competitiveness in the market? I think one thing that the importing brands could be doing a bit more, um, and it's not to say that they don't uh, haven't done this yet, but when you, when you look at sustainable mobility, yeah. you're looking at a, at a vehicle that runs off uh, effectively off electricity. So we're talking the electric car uh, option, or we're talking about potentially a, a, a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid. But um, there could be more done, I would say, in, in, in these brands investing into the charging infrastructure ecosystem that surrounds their vehicles and their products. Um, Right now we have a situation in South Africa where we've got a very uh, robust and somewhat mature uh, charging infrastructure, but it's it's really um, not at a, at a scalable level where it can service multiple vehicles at once at the charging stations, uh, nor can it really scale up to, to high traffic volumes um, that we are used to in peak periods and holiday periods, for example, in South Africa. So I would like to see the importing brand um, providing uh, some sort of uh, investment, um, potentially around uh, partnering or uh, you know, investing with some of the, the existing charging part, uh, partner networks or operating networks like, for example, grid cars, Rubicon, and upcoming zero carbon charge as well, um, providing them with some support to say, look, you guys continue building the, the charging networks. We're going to continue providing cost-effective uh, vehicles, and the, the synergy between the two is what's needed. Um, to continue on this path towards sustainable mobility. All right. Now, Accenture's research actually shows that companies prioritizing sustainability and the digital transformation outperform their peers. Now, how can, um, within South Africa, I think, how can imported brands leverage Accenture's expertise? This is obviously to embed sustainability into their business models. Accenture is, is very much on the forefront of sustainable um, solutioning and, uh, and helping our clients navigate the, their paths towards net zero. Um, almost every industry is impacted by this global shift that we're seeing. Um, there's, there's no industry that's going to come through this unscathed, uh, be, be it in, in retail or in logistics or in transport or in, in mining. Um, or in uh, you know uh, public services or healthcare and so on. Accenture serves clients across.
across all these industries um, and each one of them needs to make uh, some sort of uh, transition towards sustainable business practices or sustainable uh, energy sources and so on. Typically when you look at a sustainability project you, you're looking at what are your scope one emissions meaning what uh, kind of emissions do your direct business operations uh, uh, you know create. Um, you look at your scope two emissions which is for your operation, what, where do you get your energy source from? Um, is it coming off the grid or is there some kind of sustainable component to the energy generation, be it on-site solar or are you wheeling in some clean energy from a wind farm or a solar farm, etc. And then you have a, a view called scope three, which is what are your upstream and your downstream emissions? Are your suppliers that are bringing you your raw materials, are they using some form of sustainable mobility or are you pay, paying the price for not um, adjusting to that and likewise if you're distributing your product onto your customers um, what kind of mobility are you using there are you using sustainable and clean energies to transport your, your finished products and so on so all of these um, emissions aspects to business need to be considered Accenture really is specialized in, in helping our clients to reduce emissions across all of those scope one two and three uh, areas and really ensure that um, you know when it comes to actually measuring your emissions, you can actually be sure that uh, your strategies are working for you. Fantastic. Um, now, how does Accenture's global network and expertise enable imported brands within South Africa to stay ahead of the global trends and their best practices? Well, we are a 750,000 strong employee global company. Um, we bring um, multiple expertise and, and subject matter experts across different uh, specialist areas in, in strategy and consulting work. We have a very deep um, technology uh, base with our, our, our system integration experts and our, our cloud platform experts, our security experts. We also um, are, are ramping up very strongly in our uh, in sort of engineering and manufacturing capabilities in, in a unit called industry. Um, helping our, our clients, for example, in automotive for, for, to do their kind of automation and uh, uh, digital manufacturing transitions. And we also have a very strong, um, and it's a creative services agency, which was really all focused on our customers and, and our customers' customers in terms of their growth strategy. We call that unit Accenture Song, which is our creative uh, um, agency, our marketing, our e-commerce uh, solutions. And this cuts across all the industries I mentioned earlier. So um, coupled to that, deep research capabilities uh, on any of these topics. Um, and I think the value we can bring to any client of ours at any location um, in the world is that we've got learnings from all over the world and we can consolidate and just bring those, uh, those key lessons to you uh, at any point in time. So, I mean, Accenture exists really to help our clients navigate change and navigate disruption and do it successfully and profitably. Great, man. Um, I like the fact that we, you, you, you speak a lot of strategy and one of the things, one, 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 one of the main key focus areas uh, amongst the uh, digital transformation of businesses that we see today is data analytics. And um, what role would you say in informing your strategies as Accenture? What role does data analytics play for important brands, specifically in South Africa? Well, data and analytics is really a very, very hot topic, isn't it? Um, we are seeing it becoming more and more of a, a an executive um, tool, if you will, to, to make decisions that are based on insights, based on facts, based on, on real-time data that is uh, coming from uh, either outside the company or inside a company. Um, the ability to also leverage the newest Gen AI uh, type topics and, and, and solutions and tools that are emerging, but to use that responsibly, to use that safely as well, um, and, to, uh, and to leverage the advantage that it brings uh, specifically to Towards, um, you know, customer-facing engagement um, and using that within multiple channels. So, 
using those tools is, is key. Um, if you're not using them, you're pretty much going to be at a disadvantage and fall behind those that are able to use them and able to use them properly. Um, when it comes to importers and, and uh, the brands that we're seeing in the country, you know, I, I would say that we are going into a period of time now where we are moving away from a, a mechanical-based product that customers have been buying for, for over 100 years in the form of just a, a petrol engine car into a full digital uh, vehicle that is software defined and, and has a, a mobile operating system very similar to your mobile phone um, inside that vehicle. And if you're not using the latest cloud or Gen AI or data and analytics tools to, to be ahead um, of the curve in the way that you're interacting with your customers that are using these very advanced products that are on the horizon, then um, that's going to be a disadvantage. So the winners will be those that really can capitalize, I think, in a data and AI world. Looking at the Western countries, I'll, I'll use the, the, the case study on the United States. They have built their businesses majority on uh, SMEs and startups. We see today that their tech startups have been obviously outstanding, you know, in terms of the margins that they're reaching, uh, in terms of the returns as well of investing in technology. We're looking at South Africa. Um, there's been big talk in terms of the gap between SMEs and big business just to advise, you know, with the young startups and SMEs coming up, how would you advise them to look at the supply demand market? What are some of the products that they should actually be looking at for the next 5, 10, 20 years uh, in order for them to be absorbed as partnerships with big business and for them to actually be able to come into the market and, and, and find a, a, a strong foundation for themselves? Let me just address the first part of that question. You know, yeah. If you look at the US uh, and you look at particularly at the startup industry in, in automotive and in particularly in terms of electric vehicles, uh, one, really, one case study that stands out to me, for example, is Rivian, um, which was originally a startup. It's now a very productive very uh, you know profitable um, EV manufacturer mm -hmm. um, and, and because they were able to build a new vehicle from the ground up um, and not be burdened with any legacy processes um, they became very quickly a uh, an example of a, a leader in terms of the software needed to to build the interfaces that are inside their cars now as a testament to that and as an example to your point Volkswagen Germany made a has just recently announced a five billion dollar investment into Rivian um, to leverage the software um, engineering and the software architectures that a startup effectively was able to pull that a a hundred year old OEM wasn't able to do. Mm. So that kind of example, that kind of model, you know, applied to the South African context, um, you know. Definitely is, is a possibility if you see um, the kind of, uh, let's say, Silicon Valley type um, environments we have in, 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 in Western Cape, and uh, and we see the the, the rise of the of the e-mobility um, startups that are coming out of the Eastern Cape, um, which is becoming fast a, a hub for e-mobility in South Africa, by the way. So uh, I, I think keeping abreast of these types of trends, looking at where the world is going from a, a, a development perspective, um, trying to localize that um, for South African relevance um, and, and a South African unique transport needs when you think of our public transport, our, our minibus tracks, taxi transport, our, our buses, all of those forms of transport are, uh, are ripe for uh, innovation. And mm -hmm. I think our small to medium enterprises um, that we're seeing uh, emerging are, are recognizing that and are, are quite prominently moving fast towards solving for those. So I'm encouraged by the opportunities that the automotive transformation in South Africa will actually offer uh, our local startups and our local SMEs. Absolutely. And, you know, just thinking, about what we, we at the automotives, that's our country's biggest, probably Africa's biggest export, export market. And I, I just I'm very encouraged as well. It's something that I would like to um, share with the SME and startup community in the country that look, they should look at um, innovative uh, solutions for that market. What's your take on uh, the push and pull effect with our port, specifically looking at what's happening uh, in KZN with our ports uh, in relation to uh, road freight as well? That relationship uh, looks like it's, uh, it's, always, it's just becoming a bit rocky. 
What kind of solutions should one think, um, uh, which is say thinking out the box, what kind of solutions would be necessary for to heal that um, that relationship, if I may say? Yeah, it's a, it's a sore point, uh, uh, absolutely. And it's not something that is easily solved overnight. Um, mm. it's, it's, it's kind of symptomatic of a, of a situation that has deteriorated over time and uh, consistently gotten worse uh, with the net result that, um, you know, all the OEMs that, that manufacture in, inland um, that need to, to get their vehicles to the ports have to use road freight uh, to do so. And mm. likewise, you know, imported vehicles that are land at these ports that need to come inland have to use road freight. Uh, the net effect of that is that the consumer is paying. Um, and that's the unfortunate part, is that the cost to move vehicles on the road versus a highly cost-efficient transnet that might be operating at full efficiency uh, is like day and night. And uh, the unfortunate situation is that consumers will have to foot the bill for the inefficient transport of these vehicles um, in, in and out of our ports. Um, it's not great. Um, it, has, it has a magnified effect um, when... Um, a, a, a global decision needs to be made on a new line of, uh, of vehicles to be manufactured in South Africa with one of the OEMs. And they look at South Africa and they say, oh, well, there's this thing called load shedding that potentially could come back. Oh, and also the ports are, are, are blocked. Um, okay, we're going to choose Indonesia or we're going to choose Morocco or we're going to choose Egypt over over South Africa. So that's a, there's a real risk there that our, um, uh, our sort of collective um foot is not best foot is not forward if you know what i mean in that sense mm. and uh, we need a proper team south africa approach uh, across industry uh, to make this really uh, continue to be uh, an attractive destination for um, manufacturing of, of vehicles um, for the world what opportunities would you say or access to market initiatives uh, does the accenture uh, provide for uh, let's say south african smes and startups accenture is, is very engaged in uh, you know ensuring that we bring in intake of our um, graduates into into employment so we, we run a, a very well structured graduate uh, program um, to bring people in and, and give young people opportunities uh, we also do work with um, you know a, an ecosystem of, of SMEs um, where we can um, and and where we can you know leverage that network to to help them move forward um, there's no shortage of people within Accenture senior leaders that are available to provide like mentoring opportunities or to engage with SMEs or to help use Accenture's network to provide access for SMEs into industries as well. So I think, you know, multiple opportunities or ways that we can engage um, and, uh, and and help the ecosystem to grow. Looking at the, the, was the Smart Mobility um, Summit that was in Johannesburg uh, just a couple of weeks back and then now we've got the SA Auto Week very vibrant industry in South Africa. What's your take in terms of what is it that, uh, let's say, other industries or sectors can absorb? What's that thing that's been working for the automotive sector in South Africa? I think um, what what I'm noticing over the at least the past two years is that automotive is no longer a, an automotive only club. It's not an OEMs or retailers uh, importers only club. I think that the nature of the transformation that the industry is going through has meant that. Um, the ecosystem is now invited to the party, if I could put it that way, yeah. in the sense that uh, you're starting to see other players getting involved from, from the logistics sector and the retail sector and the charging network sector and the energy sectors, um, even to the point of seeing mining um, representation from mining companies on the panels at, at the likes of SA Auto Week and Smart Mobility. Uh, why is that? Because battery manufacturing is the new uh, is the new gold in the sense of that's where those that's where energy storage is needing to go so what are the minerals needed um, for for creating batteries at scale and how do we ensure that we can try to do this in Africa so I'm, I'm very encouraged to see the convergence of these industries uh, creating opportunities for these um, uh, conferences to to have a wider impact on on more people in the ecosystem um, we absolutely have to take advantage of that and we we have to stand up as South Africa and Africa and be relevant to the world. Otherwise, you know, we, we just lose being um, uh, lose the opportunity to capitalize on it all. Your views um, on, you know, we read that, um, for example, in France, 50% uh, uh, 
of, of, of people that had bought the, the EVs when were, were slightly not happy, but we're looking at also trends saying it might not be such a lucrative industry for that long, but then we've got the Chinese industry that is manufacturing these at large scale. What impact do you see uh, the Asian market having? Well, firstly, I think we have to always look at these studies and, and, and be absolutely clear on the context of, of headlines like that that are, are put out there. Um, they, you know, be, be aware that there's a lot of agendas at play um, across the board um, f- with various um, directions and leanings. Mm-hmm. Um, that particular study, I believe, was more a, a, a microcosm of um, the fact that the dealerships that are selling EVs in France yeah. um, might not have uh, always educated their customers on what to expect when it comes to owning an EV and charging an EV, and there might have been some disillusionment there. But yeah. there is no doubt um, that uh, the world is moving towards EVs. Um, battery electrics definitely are uh, not just a phase or a fad. Um, mm-hmm. They are the future. Um, if you just look at the exponential growth that has been happening, any headlines that, that you're seeing around the slowdown of growth is, is actually to be expected because a market cannot just go indefinitely on an exponential curve. So yeah. I think what you're seeing is an exponential curve becoming an S curve, which is uh, which is a natural progression in any adoption cycle with a new technology. Um, China is testament to that. Uh, you look at the, uh, the the complete and utter uptake of, of uh, electric vehicles in China and you look at the net impact that that's had on, on air quality, on sound quality and on, on efficiency of transport in and around city centers. It's, it's absolutely uh, impressive and mind-blowing. And maybe just lastly, look at Norway as another example, just for um, a market that, uh, although small, demonstrates what a complete commitment to this kind of mobility can produce. The, the fact there is that nine out of 10 cars sold in Norway now are electric. Wow. Um, uh, and, and also you will notice that we've crossed, well, they've crossed the threshold that there are now more electric cars on the road in total than petrol cars. And that, that growth is continuing. So again, South Africa and Africa might be a way off this, but we can certainly take lessons from the future when you see markets like this that are so progressively advanced. Thank you so much, Greg. Look, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And um, yeah, I'm glad we catch up again. But uh, you know what? To keep doing the great work that you're doing out there, Accenture. Thanks so much, Lawazi. Appreciate the time. Fantastic. Have a good evening.